Uh, namaste. Um, in paragraphs eight and nine of Nana, Bhagavan talks about other practices. That is the, 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 the main purpose of this work is to, it's, I mean, the central theme of this work is the practice of self investigation. Um, but he, in these two paragraphs, he talks about other practices. But to understand these two paragraphs in context, we, that is the, the context in which these, um, uh, these, he, he talks about other practices is, um, is made clear in the first sentence of paragraph eight. What he says in the first sentence is, manam adangvatiku. That means for the mind to, uh, um, the verb adangu can mean, um, to, it, it has a range of meanings. It, the meanings slightly vary according to the context, but the range of meanings include decease, settle, subside, yield, be subdued, be still or disappear. In this context, he's referring to the permanent cessation of the mind. So for the mind to, uh, uh, subside permanently or cease uh, forever. Vicharaneye uh, tavira veru tehunto upayangalile. There are no adequate means other than vichara. Vichara here means uh, apma vichara, self-investigation. Um, so this is the main, so what he talks about in the rest of this paragraph and in the next paragraph, he's emphasizing that all of the practices are at best just aids to the practice of self-investigation. Practice of self-investigation is the only means by which we can there, uh, know what we actually are and thereby achieve manonasa, the uh, annihilation of the mind, the eradication of ego. Um, so th this is, to, uh, we, when we read the rest of this paragraph, this, this is the, this is to be borne in mind. What Bhagavan is, uh, the main point of these two paragraphs is to um, emphasize that Atma Vichara is the only adequate means by which we can bring about the permanent cessation of mind. Temporary cessation of mind, or if not temporary cessation, at least temporary lulling of the mind can be brought about by other means. But uh, in order to eradicate the mind, Vichara is the only adequate means. Why is that? Uh, that is, we have to understand this in the context of our own teaching. The mind here means ego. That is what the mind essentially is, is just ego, the first thought I. The first thought I is a false awareness of ourself. Instead of being aware of ourself as we actually are, that is, as just I am, we are aware of ourselves as I am this or I am that. We, we identify ourselves with a bundle of five sheaths, namely the body, life, mind, intellect, will. But everything that makes up the person that we now seem to be, we identify ourselves with this and we are aware of ourselves as I am this body or I am this person. This is a false awareness of ourself because this this uh, this person, the, the collection of all these five sheets that we seem to be, appears only in waking and dream, and not in sleep. And in the, the physical body that we experience as ourselves in waking, we don't experience in dream. And the physical body we experience as ourselves in dream, we don't experience in waking. So they, these are two different bodies. The, uh, the other. Um, but, the, but we can say the mind is more or less the same, but even the mind and intellect and everything, they all disappear when we fall asleep. But we remain there and we continue to be aware of our own existence. So what we actually are is not any of these five sheaths. Therefore, ego, which is a false awareness, I am this collection of five sheaths, I'm this person, is a false awareness of ourself. In order to uh, destroy a false awareness. The only way to remove false awareness is by correct awareness. In other words, we need to be aware of ourselves as we actually are in order to destroy the mind. And in order to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, the only means is to 
investigate ourselves, to look at ourselves very keenly. This is why Bowen says this is the only adequate means. Whatever other means we may follow, they, they can at best lead us to this path. Sooner or later, whatever other path we may have followed in the past, we have to give up other practices and turn our attention back within towards ourselves. All other practices entail attending to something other than ourself. But our aim is to know ourselves, what we actually are. So only by self-investigation can we know what we actually are and thereby eradicate the mind. This is the implication of the first sentence. Um, then he goes on to talk, begin talking about other practices. In the second sentence, he says, um, if made to cease by other means, the mind remaining as if it had ceased will again rise up. In, in other words, whatever cessation of mind may be brought about by other means, it can only be temporary. Um, even if you, by some yogic practices or something, pranayama or such practices, you achieve a state of manolaya, that is only a temporary cessation of the mind. It's not permanent. Uh, so that is not our aim. Our aim is to bring about the permanent cessation of mind. So he says, if other, if made to cease by other means, the mind remaining as if it had ceased, will again rise up. So it's not permanent. It's it's only a temporary cessation. Uh, in other words, it's a state of manolaya. Manolaya means a temporary cessation of mind, like sleep. In sleep, we, the mind is is uh, ceases, but it's only a temporary cessation because it again rises up. Um, so, and then in the third sentence, he says, uh, pranayama talum, even by pranayama, manam adangam. So the the mind will uh, cease or subside even by pranayama. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, however, so long as uh, prana um, uh, remains subsided, the mind will also remain uh, subsided. And when the prana emerges, the mind will also emerge and wander under the sway of its vasanas. Um, the prana here means life which is manifested in um, all the physiological processes, such as breathing and digestion and so on. The, so prana is uh, it's, it's the life or the life force, that, that which, it, which animates the body, that which distinguishes a living body from a dead body. So by, by pranayama, by uh, restraining the breath, yogis bring about... Uh, um, uh, uh, subsidence of uh, the life, these life processes. In fact, if, if yogis become very proficient in, in pranayama and other such practices, they can, um, they can bring about the, subs uh, they can bring about a state in which uh, the breathing and the heart rate has slowed down considerably. Um, but that's very rare to achieve that. And there's no spiritual benefit in achieving that, as Bhagavan made clear. Um, uh, but, um, so what, what Bhagavan is saying in this sentence, if you, if you restrain the prana, in other words, if you, uh, if you subdue the prana, if you stop breathing, you'll, you'll stop the mind. And if you, but when the prana again emerges, when the prana again becomes active, the mind will also emerge and become active. And a very important thing he says in this sentence, he said the mind will, um, will, uh, will come out or emerge and wander under the sway of its vasanas. That is the nature of the mind. So long as we allow our attention to go away from ourselves, the mind is wandering under the sway of its vasanas. Uh, so all the troubles we experience is because we allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas. This is a, a topic that Bhagavan will deal with in much more detail in the 10th and 11th paragraphs of Nana. Um, but it's important to understand this. The nature of the mind is to wander under the sway of its vasanas. Um, but we, the vasanas are only inclinations. So we, we, we are not bound by our inclinations. We may be inclined to think of a certain thing or to see a certain thing or to experience a certain thing, but 
we can we can um, we can avoid being swayed by that inclination by clinging to uh, self attentiveness. So it's important to understand that this is the nature of the ego or mind is to wander under the way of the sway of its vasanas. So long as we allow it to go outwards, that is, it goes outwards only under the sway of its vasanas. If we cling firmly to I am, it is then not swayed by its vasanas. Um, that's a slight digression. That's not the main topic he's referring to here, but it's important that he, he put this here for a reason. He's, he's, uh, that is, he's giving us a, a side piece of information here about the nature of the mind. Nature of the mind is to wander under the sway of its vasanas. It's not bound to do so, but it, 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 it has a general tendency to wander under the sway of its vasanas. Um, though we have the choice not to be swayed by them. Um, <clears throat> then he goes on in the next sentence to explain why controlling, uh, uh, the restraining the breath will restrain the mind, or restraining the mind will restrain the breath. Um, in the next, what he says in the next sentence is, manaticum prananakum uh, pirapidum andre. That means the birthplace for both uh, mind and for prana is one. In other words, they, they both arise from the same source. Uh, the birthplace for the mind and for prana is our real nature. And then the atmosphere. But what we actually are, that is that pure awareness I am, that is the um that is the um the source from which um uh, from, from from which both mind and prana emerge. Um and then he goes on to uh, talk more about the mind. He says Nineve Manatin Sarupam. Thought alone is the uh, swarupa of the mind. Swarupa he's using here, not in the sense of our real nature, but in the sense of the very nature of the mind is thought. That is thought, as he says in verse 18 of Upadesha India, the mind is nothing. He, well, there he says only thoughts of the mind. That implies mind is nothing other than thoughts. Uh, but in that verse and here he goes on to say, um, what he says in the next sentence is, Nanenum Neneve Manatin Mudal Nenevu. The thought called I alone is the first thought. That is, all other thoughts are objects. The thought called I is the subject. In other words, it's e thought called I is a, it, it means ego, as he says in the next sentence. So the thought called I, it's the first thought. Why is it the first thought? Because since all other thoughts are objects, they cannot appear except in the view of the subject. So the subject must arise first, and then only other thoughts can appear. Actually, they arise simultaneously, but the, the, first, the, the, the thought called I is the, is the root thought, as he says in verse 18 of Upadesha India, in the view of which all other thoughts appear. So the thought called I alone is the first thought of the mind. Aduve ahankaram, it alone is ego. So here he's clarifying what he means by the thought called I is only ego. And he, this also, we need to understand from this, not only are all objects thoughts, but so too is the subject. In fact, everything other than our own real nature, from the pure awareness I am, but we actually are, is a thought. So only, only our own, that is, uh, I am denotes our, our, our existence and our awareness. So I am refers to pure being and pure awareness. Other than pure being and pure awareness, which are one and the same thing, they're not two different things, everything else is thoughts. Of all the thoughts, the first thought is this thought called I, namely ego. Um, because this alone... All other thoughts are jada, that's they're devoid of awareness. The only thought that is endowed with awareness is ego, this first thought I. So it's only in the view of ego that all other thoughts exist. No other thought is aware of any is it's, it's aware of anything. It's not aware of its own existence, it's not aware of other things. So it all appears only in the view of ego. Um, so and then he goes on to say in the next sentence, um, uh, from where ego rises, 
from there alone, the breath also rises up or sprouts out or uh, emerges. Um, so um, that is, ego is the first rising. And as soon as ego rises, the nature of ego is to rise grasping form. It always projects and grasps the form of the body as itself. And that body is always a living body. So it's a, it's a body with life. So the breath is also functioning there. So the breath emerges as soon as the, that the body and the breath appear as soon as we rise as ego. It is the nature of the ego to project and to identify a body as itself. And the body is always a living body, so the breath is there. Um, in fact, all the five sheaths, they appear uh, as soon as we rise as ego. Um, then in the next sentence, he says, therefore, when the mind ceases or subsides, the prana also ceases. And when the prana ceases, the mind also ceases. That is, to the extent to which we restrain the breath, to that extent we restrain the mind. And to the extent to which we restrain the mind, prevent it from going outward, to that extent we're also restraining the breath. This is the principle on which yoga, most of the practices of yoga are based. That is one of the central practices of Raja Yoga, it's a practice of pranayama. Because the aim of yoga, as it's said in the, uh, in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, in the first or second um, sutra, he says, yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga is the restraint of the, uh, of the chitta vrittis. Chitta vrittis means the mental activity, the thoughts of the mind. So, but how does yoga bring about that uh, restraint of, uh, of mental activity, one of the principal tools used in yoga is pranayama, because the, the nature of, of that is mind and, um, and prana are so related that if you restrain the breath, you thereby restrain the mind, and if you restrain the mind, you thereby restrain the breath. Um, so this is, this is one of the, the tools used by a, a yogi, to bring about the subsidence of mind. But because, because they're bringing about the side subsidence of mind by, by an artificial means, that is some means other than uh, self-investigation, it can only be a temporary subsidence of mind because though the mind may subside in layer, it isn't destroyed because by pranayama, you cannot know what you actually are. In order to know what one actually is, the mind has to be turned within. That's what Bhagavan implies in verse 14 of, um, of Upadesha Undia, where he's talking about the same subject. In, in the previous verse, in verse 13 of Upadesha Undia, he says subsidence of mind or dissolution of mind is of two kinds, Leia and Nasa. Leia means temporary um, uh, dissolution, Nasa means destruction, or in other words, permanent dissolution. And then he says, that which is in layer will rise again, but if its form dies in Nasa, it will not rise again. So um, having said that in verse 13, in verse 14, he says, um, the, na he, the, the nature of the mind is to subside when the breath subsides. But that mind which, which is before, that is what Bhagavan, he doesn't, he puts it in a very brief way there. He explains it in more detail elsewhere. That is when, if we, if we practice pranayama or any, any such yogic technique, we shouldn't allow ourselves to fall into layer because layer is a state like sleep. There's no spiritual benefit. You, Bhagavan used to tell the story of a yogi who, um, who went into Nivikalpa Samadhi for 300 years on the banks of Uganda. Uh, I'll just briefly tell that story because it's relevant here. That is, um, there was a yogi who was, um, who had become very proficient in going into Samadhi by means of pranayama or other yogi practices. And he lived on the banks of Uganda. And because he spent most of, much of his time absorbed in Samadhi, um, people revered him as a great sage. And he, so a disciple had come to him and the disciple was serving him very, um, very faithfully, hoping that he could learn from him how to, um, how to bring about the, um, how to achieve this state of Nivakalpa Samadhi, which for many, many people believe that's the highest spiritual attainment. So 
um, one day when that when the yogi woke up from um, uh, Nivikalpa Samadhi, having been in Nivikalpa Samadhi for some time, he was feeling thirsty. So he asked his disciple to fetch water from a Ganga. The Ganga was very nearby. Ganga means the river Ganges. So that was nearby. So the disciple went there to fetch water and he came back with the water. But by that time, the yogi had gone back into Nivikalpa Samadhi. And this time he went into Nivikalpa Samadhi so deeply, he remained in that state for 300 years. People may say, how is that possible to remain in that state for 300 years? Supposedly, I, I, don't, I don't know about this, but supposedly the very proficient yogis can go get, can be so deeply absorbed in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, but not only did their breathing slow down, their, their, um, their heart rate and everything slows down, maybe just one heartbeat every two minutes or something. So they're able to remain in that state for very prolonged periods. So this yogi, according to a story told by Bhagavan. Um, it, Bhagavan didn't say this to glorify yoga. He said it for a different reason. So this yogi remained in samadhi for 300 years. And when he eventually woke up from samadhi, the first thing he did was to ask angrily, where's my water? And then Bhagavan said, what is to be inferred from that? By, by that time, of course, the disciple was, was long dead and the nearby village had, uh, was no longer there. The Ganga had changed its course and the, the yogi was um, in the midst of a jungle that had grown up around him. But his, his first thought when he woke up was, where's my water? He asked angrily. So Bhagavan said, even the most superficial thought in the mind, that is a thought that was... Um, it was uh, the last thought that he had before he went into the Nirvikalpa Samadhi was the first thought that popped up. That means even the most superficial thought in his mind was not destroyed in spite of remaining in Nirvikalpa Samadhi for 300 years. Therefore, Bhagavan said, that he went, when not even the most superficial thought is destroyed, what to say about the Vasans? The Vasans remain as they are. So being in Nivikalpa Samadhi there is of no greater spiritual benefit than being falling asleep. Um, so it is it, because our aim is to weaken and eventually eradicate the Vasanas. So if, if remaining, since Nivikalpa Samadhi is a state of Manolaya, in other words, a state like sleep, we cannot destroy the vasanas in such a state. We can only destroy vasanas in the waking and dream state. Why is that? Because the nature of mind or ego is, as Bhagavan says, it's the wander under the sway of its vasanas. But we always have a choice whether to allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas or not to allow them to uh, ourselves to be swayed by vasanas. We are making such choices throughout the day. That is, we have innumerable vasanas, innumerable inclinations. So often, contrary inclinations are rising in our mind. Just to give a very simple example, supposing you've eaten a full meal, but it was a very tasty meal, so you feel inclined to eat a bit more. But at the same time, you know, eating more is going to, if you eat too much, you're going to get a tummy ache and, or you're, you're going to feel sick. You're not going to, it's not going to be good for your health to overeat. So you have an inclination to eat more. You also have an inclination to refrain from eating more. So we have a choice there. Do we, do we follow the inclination to uh, eat more or do we follow the inclination not to eat more? So like, like this, throughout our life, we are making choices between well, so many vasanas are rising all the time. We are free to follow this vasana or that vasana. But a really important freedom we have is we are free not to be swayed by any vishaya vasana. By clinging firmly to self-attentiveness, we thereby refrain from being swayed by vishaya vasana. When we weaken vishaya, if we allow ourselves to be swayed by any Vishaya Vasana, we are thereby strengthening it. And the more we allow ourselves to be swayed by it, the more it will get strengthened. So if we have a, if we have a, an inclination to eat chocolate, and every time the inclination rises, if we eat chocolate, that inclination is going to get stronger and stronger. But if we, if we refrain from, uh, 
from uh, being, if we avoid being swayed by that inclination, the inclination thereby becomes weaker. So it's only in the waking and dream state when the vasanas are active, when they're rising and trying to pull our mind here or there, if we, uh, if we cling firmly to self-attentiveness and thereby ab avoid allowing our attention to move away from ourselves, we are we are not allowing ourselves to be swayed by Vibhishaya Vasanas. Whenever we allow our attention to move away from ourselves towards any other thing, we are being swayed by a Vishaya Vasana. When we hold on to self-attentiveness, we are thereby not allowing ourselves to be swayed by Vishaya Vasanas, and so they grow weaker and weaker and weaker. So it's only in the waking and dream states that we can weaken Vishaya Vasanas. And until we weaken our Vishaya Vasanas to a considerable extent, we will not be able to turn our mind within deeply enough to bring about the eradication of ego. So the, the same practice of self-attentiveness, but by which we can weaken our vasanas, we will eventually, uh, by that same practice, we will bring about the uh, annihilation of ego, which is the root of all vasanas. Only when ego is destroyed are all vasanas destroyed. So that's why Bhagavan always warned against um, Nivikalpa Samadhi. That is the only practice Bhagavan recommended. Is that, that is, for those who were not willing to follow this practice, who were not attracted to this practice of self-investigation, Bhagavan would sometimes um, guide them in other practices, whether bhakti practices or pranayama or whatever. But the, the, the main pra the practice that Bhagavan recommended of his own accord was only this practice of self-investigation because Bhagavan knew the supreme efficacy of this practice. And this is the only adequate means to bring about the destruction of mind. Whatever other paths we may follow, sooner or later we have to come back to this path. Oh, oh I, I, I can't, I, yes, I was saying earlier, um, about verses 13 and 14 of, of Upadesha India. So what Bhagavan says in verse 13 of Upadesha India is that, um, is, uh, in, sorry, in verse 14, he said, the nature of the mind is to subside, uh, by, uh, when the breath subsides. By restraining the breath, we thereby restrain the mind. But before allowing the mind to subside in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, we should, we should send it on what he calls their or vari. Or vari, um, vari means path. Or has two meanings, both of which are applicable in this context. The primary meaning of or in this context, it is the root of a verb that means to investigate or know. So or vari means the investigating path. In other words, a path of self-investigation. We can also take or to mean one. So it means the one path. What is the one path that will bring about the destruction of mind? As he made clear in so many places, the one path is only this path of self-investigation. So whether we take it as the one path or the path of self-investigation, it's the same path he's referring to. It's only this one path of self-investigation. So only when the mind is sent on that uh, investigating path will its form die. In other words, we can bring about the destruction of mind only by uh, so by sending it on this path of investigating, in other words, turning our attention back within to see what we actually are. Um, so uh, even if we even if we practice pranayama, we shouldn't take it to such an extent that we fall into layer. Before falling into layer, we we can bring about a certain quietness of mind, a certain degree of uh, of uh, subsidence of mind. And then we should use that quiet mind to turn our attention within back towards ourself. Um, sorry, there seems to be some background sound. Uh, Ted and Jody, I think you've got your mic on. Okay, I did. I was going to ask you a question about that. Okay. I'll... Oh, yes, certainly, certainly, yes. And then I'll turn it off. We, we no, no, you, you ask your question. Yeah. Please, please. Um, we have a mutual acquaintance. Uh, who practices self-inquiry to the point where to hear him talk about it is repeating I am, I am, I am, and, mm -hmm. and other components that we are all familiar with over and over and over again, way to the point where uh, 
It tires him out, but it also gains him what he calls a state of temporary samadhi. And he's done that several times, and um, it's quite impressive. But he always underscores the point that it tires him out because it's such a heavy load of repetition that he has to go through. And in my mind, I think I'm missing some component of self-inquiry. Maybe, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Because it's sort of like when it re really gets right down to it, I'm doing something almost by rote. It's almost like saying two times two is four, two times two is four. And uh, expecting that that's going to take me to the state that I anticipate arriving at soon. So when I hear that doing away with our vasanas by replacing them with something else is a way to help quell the mind and, and bring on perhaps an altered state of self-identity, I think of that practice being highly repetitious rather than filled with self-discovery, yeah. additional self-discovery items. Where Bhagavan, am I wrong? Yes. Yeah. Bhagavan did sometimes say, for people who found, find that he, for many people, when they're first told about this practice of self-investigation, they are not able to grasp how can we attend to ourselves? Because they're so accustomed to attending to objects that it all thought, everything we're aware of, everything other than ourselves, all thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories, everything is something anya, something other than ourselves. In self investigation, whatever else we may be aware of, but one says, to whatever may appear, to whom does it appear? We have to, that, the implication of that, that's not asking the question to whom it appears. But one phrased that, that is, he, but one expressed that pointer in the form of a question. But what he implied by that question is, whatever may appear, to whom does it appear? In other words, we have to turn our attention away from what has appeared back towards ourselves, the subject. In other words, we, we turn our attention away from all objects, back towards the subject. For many people, they, their minds are so gross and outward going that they're not able to grasp, how can I attend just to the subject? How can I attend just to I? And if they try to do so, they, they look for some object called I or, or something. So people often have difficulty. So Bhagavan, for such people, Bhagavan said, it's sufficient just to go on saying, I, 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 or I am, I am. He didn't recommend it exactly as a japa. He recommended it that we should, that is, if we're thinking of that term, I, Bhagavan made it clear, it's not just the word we have to think about. It's not just the word I or the word I am, because that is, any word is an object. But every word refers to something. So what is it that this word I or I am refers to? It refers to ourselves. So it, it is an aid to help people become familiar with attending to themselves. But if we, but we, it's very easy to do it wrongly. If we are, if we are repeating I, I or I am, I am and attending to the word, Rather than to what that word refers to, we are attending to an object because every word, every thought is an object. We are a, every thought other than the primal thought I, that's the ego, is an object. So our aim is not to attend to any object, but only to attend to a subject. So when Bhagavan said, uh, suggested that people try repeating I, he made it clear the aim of repeating I is to turn our attention back to ourselves because what is self-investigation is nothing but being self-attentive as he says in the 16th paragraph of nana the, the name atmavichara refers only to the practice of always keeping the mind fixed in oneself uh, keeping the mind fixed in oneself means keeping the attention fixed on oneself so uh, that's sort of the, the hazard is for me, being raised Catholic anyway, where I yeah. was religiously to recite the rosary, 50 repetitions yeah. of the yeah. Eric and five of the Lord's Prayer, yeah. and Apostles' Creed at the end, yeah. and whatnot. Um, I found, and this is a word that I never hear anybody using here, and nobody's ever heard me use this word, so I use it very cautiously. 
I found that in my childhood and in my young adulthood, my siblings still say the rosary all the time. Yeah. Uh, I have rosaries blessed by Mother Teresa, and yeah. they, they love saying the rosary. For me, it becomes boring, and I use that word very cautiously, yeah. because I can be making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich while I'm doing I, I, I am, I am, I am that I am, uh, and it seems to be counterproductive. It's so you're saying the self, um, self-reverential, which has a short shelf life for me because my mind is just so active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so in, that, in, that, that is the problem with any japa. It can become mechanical. If you do, for example, if you do japa of the name of God, if, uh, if you're a Christian, you can say Jesus, 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 or for us, Ramana, 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 any name of God or any mantra, if you repeat it very if, if you're not attending to that to which the, the name refers, very quickly it become, become, become mechanical. You can be thinking all sorts of thoughts and you know, this repetition can be going on in the back of your mind. So it is, I mean, it, it, it's, it has limited value, such practices. They, that is, Bhagavan recommended, Bhagavan said of all the names of God, the first and foremost name is I or I am. So, so if we repeat this word I or I am, we're not to do it mechanically. We are to do it with great devotion, great love. Understanding that that which is shining in our heart as I, you know, with that fundamental awareness of our own existence, that itself is God. So we need to do it with love and devotion. But it can very easily become it can very easily become mechanical if we if we are not attending to that to which this the word I refers. What did the word I refer to? Only to that fundamental awareness of our own existence. So repeating I can be an aid, but it has to be it ha- the aid has to be applied. Properly, it shouldn't become mechanical. Another thing is, you said your, uh, you said that acquaintance of yours, he repeats "I am, I am," to such an extent that it leads to samadhi. The, the term samadhi has different meanings in different contexts. There are different types of samadhi. Some types of samadhi are said to be savikalpa. The kalpa means differences. So, so long as you're if you attain a certain state of mental absorption by meditating, say, on a name or form of God or, med- or something, but you're still aware of a difference between you and whatever you're meditating on, that is Savikalpa Samadhi. The Samadhi that yogis are aiming for is Nivikalpa Samadhi. Nivikalpa Samadhi means without any differences. In other words, they want to bring about the dissolution of this uh, of this distinction between subject and object. When subject and object dissolve, you, the, mind, the mind dissolve because they, 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 the mind can only stand by holding on to things other than itself. So when you bring about that dissolution of the difference between subject and object, you subside in what is called manolaya. That is, the yogis refer to that state of manolaya that they bring about by their practices as nivikalpa samadhi, samadhi without any differences. And they even call it kevala nivikalpa samadhi. Kevala means oneness. So it's, it's that single state of, of not being aware of anything other than themselves. But it's only a state of manolaya, Bhagavan said. It's not manonasa. So, and being in such a state of manolaya is, a, that's why Bhagavan often used to tell that story of the yogi on the banks of a Ganga to emphasize that it's a dead end. You, know, you can remain in Nirvikalpa Samadhi for 300 years, 3,000 years, it doesn't matter. There's absolutely no, ben, no greater benefit in being in that state than there is in being asleep. We need to, it's here and now in the waking state. What is our aim? Our aim is to just ultimately, our aim is to bring about the eradication of ego. In sleep, there is no ego. In Nivakalpa Samadhi, there is no ego. It's dissolved back into its source. But it's only a temporary dissolution because it hasn't been brought about in order for the for ego to die. Ego is a false awareness of ourselves. 
Only when we as ego are aware of ourselves, not as I am this or I am that, but just as mere I am, as that pure awareness I am, will ego be destroyed because ego, ego is ego only so long as it's grasping things other than itself. When it tries to grasp itself and it sees itself as pure awareness, as soon as ego sees itself as pure awareness, it ceases to be ego. It is, it is permanent. It is the permanent dissolution of ego is brought about, but annihilation or eradication of ego is brought about. That is our aim. And that can be achieved only by self investigation. And self investigation doesn't mean just repeating I. Repeating I can be an aid to self investigation. It is an aid to the extent to which it turns our attention back towards ourselves. But if you're just repeating the word I, I mechanically, and if your attention is on the word rather than on what the word is referring to, then that is not self-inquiry. That is just, uh, you can be repeating Coca-Cola, 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 it's of no use. You need to, re the, the reason why Bhagavan recommended this practice of, of repeating I, I, and he's not do it, recommending that you do it quickly, like how many, how many eyes can I repeat in, in, um, in uh, 20 minutes of meditation? It's not like that. It's not a race. In order to apply that clue that Bhagavan uh, gave us uh, uh, effectively, we need to repeat it slowly and contemplatively. And what are we to be contemplating on? Not on the word I, but on what that word is referring to. Because the only reason why Bhagavan recommended repeating I or I I am is as an aid to turn our attention back towards ourselves. And what might be the best description to accompany the phrase I am with? In my own case, I use two other words, which I'm sure many, many people use. I assume they're correct. I am pure awareness. And, and that helps expand my understanding of what I'm trying yeah. to get across. Yes, but even that is not recommended by Bhagavan. Bhagavan no. says, Well, I asked that. Yeah, that, that, that is, there are many verses in Uludunapu where Bhagavan is talking about, in verse 27 of Uludunapu, that is that, that, that meditation, I am pure awareness, or I am Brahman, or I am that, whatever, the wording may be different, but it's all, it's referring to what we actually are. So Bowen said, the state in which one exists without rising as I is the state in which one is that, the state in which we are that. Without investigating the place from which I rises, how to attain that state, how to attain the destruction of oneself in which I does not rise. The place from which I rises means that fundamental awareness of our own existence, what we actually are. So Bhagavan is, is saying we, we cannot bring about the experience, the, the, the experience that is denoted by that term. When, he, when the, they just say, you are that, what is their aim? Their aim is to turn our attention away from looking outside for some that or Brahman, or God, or happiness, or whatever it may be, or truth, or reality, or whatever. Stop looking outside. You are that. Look at yourself is the implication. That is missed by many people. But the whole purpose of all the four Mahavakyas, they're all referring to what is called Jiva Brahma Aikya, the oneness of Jiva and Brahman. Brahman means the, the ultimate reality. So what we actually are is only that ultimate reality. But in order to experience the ultimate reality, there's no use, to, well, it's of very limited use to say, I, I am that ultimate reality, I am pure awareness, because that's, again, it's, a, it's an activity of the mind. Who is thinking I am pure awareness? It's only ego. Who is thinking I am Brahman? It's only ego. It's a, so long as we experience ourselves as ego, it's actually a lie to say I am Brahman. That is, the ego is not Brahman, the reality of ego. I am in ego is a mixed awareness. I am Ted. That's I, a surprise a statement Ted, you just Ted, made to my ears yes. by saying I am pure awareness is only a statement of the ego. Uh, yes. That's that's kind of a shocker, but... But this, this is what Bhagavan said. I am this or I am that is only ego. But pure awareness is only I am.
Thank you for that. So, so now you experience yourself as Ted. When you're thinking I am pure awareness, who is thinking I am pure awareness? The one who is aware of himself as I am Ted. So in effect, you're saying Ted is pure awareness. Ted is not pure awareness. That we, there is an ego that is aware of itself as I, I am Ted. That ego is, a, is, the, is that mixed awareness, I am Ted. In that mixed awareness, what is Brahman? Only I am. But so long as you're thinking, I am Brahman, again, that you're identifying yourself with some things. If you have some idea, what is pure awareness? What is Brahman? What is God or whatever? Uh, Shiva, Ham, Shiva, Ham. I am Shiva, I am Shiva. We have some idea of what is Shiva, what is Brahman, what is pure awareness. In order to know ourselves as pure awareness, we have to cease thinking of anything other than ourselves. We have to turn our attention wholly towards I. It, it, it okay. may be an aid. Bhagavan says in Ulladunapati, he said, thinking, I am not this body, I am that, may be an aid, but is it investigation? Implying, no, it is not investigation. So if, if thinking I am pure awareness helps you to turn your attention back towards yourself, towards what you actually are, then it is an aid. But it, it's only, it's a very limited aid. What? By practicing self-investigation, we need to become a we need to become a familiar with what it is what is meant by the term self-attentiveness. What is meant by the term self-investigation? It means just being trying to be aware only of ourselves, not of anything else. Once we become once we practice this sufficiently to become familiar with it then all aids are unnecessary. It's not necessary to repeat I. It's certainly not necessary to repeat I am pure awareness or I am Brahman. Bhagavan, one of the reasons why Bhagavan recommended repeating I, it's more useful to repeat I than to repeat I am Brahman. Because anyway, Brahman is nothing other than I. So, okay, if Brahman is I, then just think, just attend to I. Don't attend to anything else. So, for, for me, uh, word I or I am is more effective at turning our attention back towards ourselves than thinking I am Brahman. Because Brahman is some, we got some idea, or oh, Brahman is some very big thing, some uh, absolute reality. We got some, it's an idea in the mind. So, so long as, so long as we don't experience ourselves as Brahman, Brahman is just an idea. When we experience ourselves as Brahman, we alone exist. There's nothing else. Nothing. There's no mind, no ego, no thinking or anything. So, M Michael, if I can ask, uh, you're saying that Atma Vichara or self investigation done properly will not lead to Samadhi. It will lead to Sahaja Samadhi. Sahaja Samadhi, which is not Nervikopa yes, or. Yes. Uh, or the other one. Yeah, 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 Kalpa. It, it, it will lead only to Sahaja Samadhi. It will not, in other words, Bhagavan generally didn't use this term Samadhi much. He, the reason right, Bhagavan right. talked about Sahaja Samadhi, Samadhi is, is a very important term in yoga. It's not a term yes. that is native to Advaita. But because the, because the Advaitins had to, uh, had, because in, in, in the old days in India, there were many competing schools of philosophy. So each, 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 um, each philosophical view was trying to establish their own view of the correct view. So they, there's a lot of, um, a lot of interaction between these different schools of philosophy. And each, when you argue with someone, you have to argue with them on their own terms. So because Advaita had to argue with yoga on its own term, it, it, it used the term samadhi. So it's mm -hmm. only in that sense that samadhi is used in Advaita. Bhagavan said the only real samadhi is sahaja samadhi. What does he mean by sahaja samadhi? That state of pure awareness. So sahaja samadhi is our goal. That is, we don't right. have to call it Sahaja Samadhi because as soon as we, when did we learn the term Sahaja Samadhi? We, 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 we were not born with that term. So sometime along in the course of our life, we learned this term 
or Sahaja Samadhi, Nivikalpa Samadhi, all these types of Samadhi we learned about. So they, they, we, as soon as we think about Samadhi, it's something other, it seems to be something other than ourselves. Sahaja Samadhi is nothing other than ourselves. It's what we actually are. Right. I, so I, I think, I think a lot of the confusion and it seems very prevalent out there. Samadhi is a state of, of no thought and, 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 and so many people sort of, uh, make that as a goal, a thoughtless that, state that, as a goal. That is a fundamental mistake people make. Yeah, and and it's really investigating the self to the extent where the thoughts will fall away. But it's yeah. the the thoughtless state is not the goal. But it's I not, think oftentimes it, it's taken it, as a goal. It, it, so pranayama bi- and all these other yeah. things. It's a yeah. byproduct. That is in yoga, thoughtlessness is the goal. That's why they say yes. yoga is chitta vritti naroda. Yoga right. is a restraint of a, a mental activity, a state of no mental activity is the aim of the yogis. But that is not, That's not our goal. Bhagavan says in the sixth paragraph of Nana, he says, what does it matter however many thoughts arise? As and when each thought arises, investigate to, if you investigate to whom it arises, it will be clear to me. Then you hold on to that me. So and then the thoughts will, by its then nature, the thought will subside. subside. But that's a byproduct. That's not our aim. That's a by. That's not our aim. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Because sleep is a state without thought. But what's the use of being asleep? I mean, we need to sleep when we're tired. But they, we don't make any spiritual progress in sleep. So merely seeking a state devoid of thought is is uh, it's a it's a dead end. It leads to nirvikalpa. It leads to layer. Or, Nivikalpa Samadhi, as they call it. Um, coming back to the question... Which, which is asked, a pleasant pleasant state to be in, pleasant. for sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. If we could sleep forever, we'd have no problems. <laughs> the problem with Leia is the same as a problem But we'll come back. Sleep. That's the problem. Sooner or later, we come back again. That's right. And we come back with all the same old problems. Yeah, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so our aim is to bring about not temporary dissolution of mind, permanent dissolution of mind. Permanent dissolution of mind is what is called um, is, is what is called uh, manonasa. That is our aim. And that can be brought about only by we as ego being aware of ourselves as pure awareness. But ego can never be aware of itself as pure awareness because as soon as it's aware of itself as pure awareness, it ceases to be ego. What is aware of pure awareness is only pure awareness. Because pure awareness cannot be an object. So in order to know pure awareness, we have to be pure awareness. And in order to be pure awareness, we are already pure awareness, but we seem to be something other than pure awareness because we've risen as ego. So our sole aim of Bhagavan's teachings, of any of the ultimate aim of all spiritual paths, whether they're aware of it or not, is the dissolution of ego. If ego is dissolved, all problems are solved. And what then remains is just pure awareness and nothing other than pure awareness, which is what always actually exists. Um, since you referred to Sahaja Samadhi, Bhagavan, um, Bhagavan generally used the term Sahaja Samadhi to refer to the, our natural state, the, the final goal. That is, uh, when, when ego is dissolved, that state of pure awareness, which is sometimes called Churiya or the fourth, it's also what is called Sahaja Samadhi. Bhagavan also, in at least one place, spoke about the practice of Sahaja Samadhi. In the, in the introduction that he wrote for the, um, for his, uh, for his Tamil translation of Drik Drisi of Ivaka, in his introduction, he wrote, he referred to, um, Sahaja Samadhi Parakatal, by the practice of Sahaja Samadhi. And he explained what he meant by that practice. Um, Taneye, oneself alone, Bahiyanta Drishta Bedam Indri, Epodum Nadum Sahaja Samadhi Parakatal. That means by the practice of Sahaja Samadhi, which is always investigating or attending to oneself alone without any distinction between inside and outside. That is, 
So long as our attention is turned outwards, we need to turn our attention back within. But when our attention is fixed so keenly on ourselves, the distinction between inside and outside dissolves. That's what he means, what, what he implies there. So they're very going very deep in this practice of self-investigation is what Bhagavan refers to as the practice of Sahaja Samadhi. So that implies that there, prior to the complete dissolution of ego, there is a state where the inside and outside are, are not distinguishable. To, to, to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, we cease right. to be aware of other things. So long as we're aware of other things, the distinction of, of, um, of inside and outside is very true. I am inside, everything else is outside. But that right, distinction... Right, because it's a practice, there, there, there is a state, I guess, prior to the complete dissolution where this, this inside-outside distinction uh, disappears, if, if you want to call it that? Not completely. That is... Okay. So, so long as there's the slightest awareness of anything other than ourselves, Mm-hmm. There is, there is still a distinction between inside and outside. When we cease to be, a, when we are so keenly focused on, in, when our self attentiveness is so keenly focused, but we're aware of nothing other than ourselves, that brings about the dissolution of of ego, and thereby it brings about the dissolution of um, the distinction between inside and outside. So, so but long then, as we're practicing, then it's not a practice. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, yeah. so long as we're practicing self attentiveness, the the distinction between inside and outside is dissolving, but it's not completely dissolved until ego is right. completely dissolved. Because it's only in the view of ego that there's inside and outside. So long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves, what is other than ourselves is outside. And other than ourselves doesn't mean only other than this body. It doesn't mean even even our thoughts, our perceptions, everything is other than ourself. The only thing that is not other than ourself is ourself. And so when Bhagavan talks about turning within, what he means by turning within is turning towards I. Okay, but there's a sense of, of dissolution during uh, as so you long practice as you, this? So long as you're... You're aware of a dissolution. That dissolution is something I've ever I, I got it. Yeah. Yes. But since this is considered a practice, isn't there yes. some, there, some experience at all? Or is it just our aim is there's to, no difference and then all of a sudden it's gone? <laughs> our aim is to experience only ourselves. Right. What All other things will drop off. But so long as we're aware of them dropping off, our attention is on them. It's like Bhagavan often used to say, if, if you're, when people talk about pranayama, Bhagavan sometimes used to say, you need not practice pranayama. Just be self-attentive. To the extent you're self-attentive, the prana will automatically subside. Because by being self-attentive, you bring about the subsidence of mind, thereby the prana subsides. But if you, if you then say, oh, so, has the prana stopped yet? If, as soon as you look to see if the prana has stopped, your attention has gone away from yourself. So, the, the distinction between inside and outside will dissolve to the extent that we are self-attentive. But to the extent that we're aware of that dissolution, it's not happening because our attention is again going away from ourselves. So, we need to be so... Happy. That's why it's very important, the point you brought up. Really seeking thought a state without thought is not our aim our only aim is knowing what we ourselves actually are so our attention should only be on ourselves when our attention is only on ourselves the thoughts will drop off but we're not going to oh the thoughts have now dropped off we don't if you think the thoughts have dropped off that's a gain of thought and well, i you, had you to snap rise back to in yes, yes. So, so but there's still an awareness that continues Right, there is, the con- there is awareness only never awareness. ceases. There is, there is only, only awareness. That is so. What drops off is awareness of anything other than ourself. What right. can never drop off is the pure awareness because that is what we actually are. Even in sleep, awareness of ev- that we are not aware of anything at all in sleep, but we are still aware. 
We can say we're aware of our existence. We're aware I am. But our existence or I am is not an object we're aware of. That is awareness itself. So in sleep, there is only awareness, nothing but awareness. There's we're not, not awareness aware of anything. But we're not aware that we're aware at that point. Yes, I you mean, are. Okay. When and you I, wake up and rise, when you wake up, you rise as ego. That ego was absent in sleep. Right. So when ego... And body awareness absent in sleep. That is, we are able to recognize from the perspective... Now we are ego in this waking state. When we, when we consider our experience in sleep, we are able to recognize, yes, we did exist in sleep, and we were aware that we existed in sleep. Now, now we very clearly know where I slept. We, 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 it's not a, it's not, we don't need anyone else to tell us that we slept. When we wake up from sleep, we, we know I slept. And we also know the difference between sleep and dream. Or I, I slept, but there were so many dreams. Or I had a very peaceful sleep, no dreams at all. So we're aware of having been in a state in which there were no dreams at all. So how can we be aware of having been in that state if we were not aware in that state? But what is aware in that state is only I am. Now ego has risen as I am Ted. So from the perspective of ego, though it's got some vague impression, yes, I did exist in sleep. I, I was in a state where, in which I wasn't aware of anything. It seems to be a state of darkness because ego is so familiar with being aware of things other than itself. But what that is why we are able to recall that we were in a state in which we were not aware of anything is because of the continuity of the fundamental awareness I am. That continues in all the three states. But what is now saying Oh, I can't remember what I experienced in sleep. That is ego, which wasn't there in sleep. Only that is ego, the, the reality of ego, what ego actually is, is only that I am. But when we rise as ego, we're aware of ourselves as I am Michael or I am Ted. As that, that adjunct limited awareness is what is called ego. What remained in sleep is not that ad adjunct limited awareness, it's the unlimited pure awareness. So we know that we existed in sleep, we know we were in a state in which we were not aware of anything, but we, uh, we are not able to, to grasp what that state is, because what was in that state is just I am. If you want to know, if you want to clearly understand what you experienced in sleep, what you experience in sleep is what is even now shining in your eye. So hold on to that eye, and the, the more we, the, the deeper we go in the practice of self investigation, the more blindingly obvious it is that sleep is actually a state of awareness. We're not aware of anything in sleep, but we are aware. Just as we are aware now, the difference between sleep and waking or dream is in sleep, there is just awareness. In waking and dream, there is awareness and awareness of other things. You're helping me a whole lot in gaining a greater appreciation for everything you're talking about. Yeah. There's still a part of me that feels like I'm the only one here who doesn't get it because I agree and go so far as to say, I know what you're talking about intellectually, but experientially, of course, I can't know what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I have an inkling of what I'm talking about because of the, this, this practice. But if I really knew what I was talking about, I wouldn't be talking. I would be drowned in that uh, infinite ocean of Satchitananda. There would be no eye to rise and talk about anything. <laughs> That's helpful. You, you made it clear. Maybe one day but, I'll actually be able but, to say, I'm getting this not just from a but all these, all these words are just pointers. It, yeah. the, the true clarity can be gained only from within. So it's only by practicing this that it, the, the real clarity will come. And as we go deeper in this practice, it becomes more and more clear to us. I related to it the most the minute you said, in deep sleep, there's only the I am. 
I think yes. that's what I said. And yes. of course, the I am is always aware. Yes. And, and, and I'm who's the I am? I am the I am. You are. You are. <laughs> Not Ted, but you. That helps me by linking all of those together. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. That Bhagavan's teachings are extremely simple. But why we why we need to go on thinking about them? Because I, I, we shouldn't be just thinking about them. We need to be applying them in practice. But the more we apply them in practice, the deeper our, our, our understanding will become. Oh, and one other thing. You said you understand it intellectually. We need to understand the nature of intellect. There are different levels of intellectual understanding. There's the, the, most, the most superficial level is just a conceptual understanding. But intellect isn't just about reasoning. Intellect is being able to distinguish one thing from another. So as we go, as we go deeper in this practice, our intellect will be, become a sharper instrument. That's why Bhagavan uses terms in Uludu In verse 23, he talks about nun matyal. That means a very subtle intellect or very sharp intellect in um in verse 28, he talks about kundamatyal. That means a very, a very uh, uh, sharpened or pointed uh, um, intellect. In other words, they're, they're very keenly focused. So as we go deeper in this practice, our intellectual understanding becomes more and more subtle and more and more refined. It's not, it's, it ceases to be just a mere conceptual understanding. It becomes a clarity. And eventually we'll be swallowed in that clarity, then intellect is, 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 is lost there. I mean, we don't need intellect. Intellect is necessary to distinguish ourselves from all other things, to distinguish I from all the adjuncts, to distinguish what is real from what is unreal, what is permanent from what is impermanent. But eventually, e intellect is just a tool. Intellect will dissolve along with ego in the infinite clarity that we actually are. Yeah, that, that's really great. Jody just said it. And I, uh, I want to make sure everybody's aware where I am when I say intellectually. It's at the most superficial level there can be. Yeah, yeah. We're all still relatively superficial, but by this practice, we go deeper. That is why this practice is all important. Yeah. And the practice, as... as um, as Dan uh, emphasized, it's not just about being free of thoughts. You can be free of thoughts for 10,000 years. It doesn't solve any problem. We need to know who am I? We need to attain to the reality that, that is, we need not be concerned about any other thoughts. There's only one thought we need to be concerned about, this first thought I. And even in this first thought I, this first thought I, is that pure I am mixed with adjuncts. So the only portion of that uh, thought I am, uh, thought, thought, uh, that thought called I, that we need to be concerned about is the I am portion. Forget Ted, forget all the adjuncts. Only I am we ought to hold on to. Because that alone I, I is what is real. I have a question about that. Michael, can I ask a question about yes, that? Yes. So when I'm... Uh, Hearing words like samadhi and uh, <clears throat> no thought and holding on to I am, like holding on to I am actually sounds like a mental or a physical challenge, like there's a, something outside of me or within me I'm trying to grasp onto as opposed to um, just being. Yeah. And yet when uh, during the practice, silence occurs and i'm aware of that silence and then at some point i'm not aware of that silence and a period of time goes by and i think what you're talking about is that 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 time that goes by so fast is like sleep or monolaya and not uh well it, that's just what it is it's, I, I believe that's mono that's what you're talking about is monolaya and yet to hold on to the I, I, I do things like, I know I'm using words, but I say things like I exist or 
like Ted says, feel awareness. And yet at that time, I know I'm in some form of duality and I'm a little confused at which way to go. And then when I get to some point of confusion, I just say, well, just be still. And, and again, all thoughts drop away. So I guess my question is, is am I going the right way with my practice? Okay. Um, well, first thing to understand, whatever words may be used, they, words can only be pointers because what we are talking about is something that is beyond thought and beyond words. So the words are pointers. So when it is said, hold on to I am, it doesn't mean hold on to the thought, to the words I am or to the idea I am. What do, we, what, does the, what do the words I am refer to? I am means I exist. So we're holding on to our existence, as you say, our being. So how do we hold on to being? Just by being. So whatever words we, we use are an extremely clumsy way. I mean, words are clumsy. We can't, we can't convey it perfectly by words. But Bhagavan has used many words all the work, we need to think deeply about the words that Bhagavan has talked about. For example, in verse 26 of Upadesha India, he says, knowing oneself, uh, oh, oh, being oneself alone is knowing oneself. So yes, the practice is just being. Somewhere you produce, just being. But what the, how to just be? Because I am even now. What does just be mean? It means being without thought. But it's not about getting rid of thought. In order to just be, we have to hold on to being. So whatever words we, we, we use, they're inadequate, but we have to see beyond the words. So we, all this becomes clear to us only to the extent we put it into practice. But it's very, one thing about what you said about silence or, uh, or whatever, what we are looking for is not anything that comes and goes. Any silence that comes and goes is not the real silence. We, we are trying to attend to that which is ever present, that which never comes or goes, which is always just is. That is only ourself. Everything else comes and goes. The three states, waking, dream, and sleep, come and go. The ego comes and goes. Uh, everything experienced by the ego, such as uh, including silence or uh, samadhi or uh, being free of thought, these are all things that come and go. What is constant? That is what we are investigating. What is constant is only ourself. So we have to hold on to ourself alone, nothing else. So if, if you experience silence, to whom does that silence appear? You need to turn yourself, your attention back to, to the eye to which all these things appear. In other words, you need to turn your attention back to yourself. At first, when we turn our attention towards ourselves, it is, it is I mixed with adjuncts. But as we go deeper and deeper in this practice, the adjuncts drop off and we come closer to that state of pure awareness. The words are inadequate. I know I, it, when I try to express it, I can feel the inadequacy of the words, but we can't convey more. But it, it becomes clear only to the extent to which we try to, other than words are all pointers, try to follow those pointers, try to understand those pointers, think deeply about what Bhagavan is saying, how he describes it here, how he describes it there. What is he pointing at? He's pointing only at ourselves. So let us try to hold on to ourselves. Try to just be self-attentive. Hey, Michael, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it is, Bhagavan says, there's nothing easier than this. It is truly very, very easy. It seems difficult to us because of the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas. We still have so much... Yeah inclination to go outward, so much taste in enjoying all these um, these vishaya, these phenomena, things other than ourselves. That's what makes it seem, because we are not yet willing to let go of all these things, we say we're not able to hold on to I. 
We're not able to hold on to ourselves. We're not able to hold on to ourselves because we're not able to really let go of other things. But the more we try to hold on to ourselves, the more deeper we'll be able to go and the more automatically other things will drop off. It kind of makes me want to go practice. <laughs> yes, that's the whole purpose. There's no use of talking about these things if we don't have a great, not, we don't have to go practice. Practice here and now. We, we, we don't have to close our eyes or shut out the world because what we are, the practice is only attending to eyes, to that which is always shining so clearly. What is the light that illumines all these things? That is, we, the physical light of lumens of the physical objects. But what, what enables us to know all these physical objects? It's only the mind light. And what is the light that illumines the mind? It is only I, I am. So we are the a light of all lights. So since we are always shining clearly, we don't have to worry. We don't have to, even in the midst of talking like this, what are we talking about? We are talking only about ourselves. So the self-attentiveness can go on even in the midst of all these activities. Because whatever we may be doing, who is doing it? I am. So we, we, we can never, we, can, we seem to have moved away from ourselves by rising as ego. We've never actually moved away from ourselves. We are always just as we are. But we need to be very, now we have so much interest in knowing things other than ourselves. We need to, we need to give up our interest in other things by cultivating interest in knowing only ourselves. The more interested and passionate we are, the more eager we are to see who am I, the deeper we'll be able to go in this path. So, so are you saying, Michael, that my interest in what you're saying uh, should be discarded? No, because <laughs> ultimately, yes. <laughs> because what I'm saying is that it's not me. I mean, it, it, I'm just I'm just trying to point out what Bhagavan has pointed out. So we we should be very interested in this subject because this subject is about knowing ourselves. But it it's not just the it's not just the philosophy. It's not just the ideas. What are all these things pointing at? Bhagavan's teachings are all pointing at one thing and one thing alone. That is you. Yeah, so, that was just joking, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, you're 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 pointing to what Ramana was pointing to. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we we shouldn't be interested in the pointing. We should be interested in what is pointed at, and what is pointed at. You are that. Tatvamasi. So attend only to yourself. Amen. <laughs> so shall I um shall I go on with this paragraph? We we're nearing the end of it. Um so just yes, to wrap, wrap wrap it up, unless anyone has any more questions. Okay, what Bhagavan says, so in, in the previous sentence, he says, therefore, when the mind subsides, the prana also subsides, and when the prana subsides, the mind also subsides. And then he, he says, um, prana uh, manatin stula rupam enapadam. The prana is called the gross form of the mind. Um, and he then goes on to say, until the time of death, the mind keeps the prana in the body, and the moment the body dies, grasping it, that means grasping the breath, it goes. In other words, it takes the prana with it. What that means is, that is, uh, what, what we take with us when we go, when we leave this body, we leave the body and the mind and everything. We, we take, what we take with us is the vasanas, the seeds, that give rise to all these things. So one of the, one of the, most basic vasanas is a vasana of breathing because we always experience ourselves as a body. So we take the when Bhagavan says we take the breath with us, we take that that we take with us that that inclination to breathe, that inclination to be 
living. But that is not, we, we take it with us until we bring about the dissolution of ego. And then we lose that inclination to, to identify a body as I. Um, and then in the final sentence, he says, therefore, pranayama uh, is just an aid to restrain the mind. Restrain the mind here means to, to make it, uh, um, to make it, uh, uh, cease tempor temporarily, uh, but will not bring about manonasa, annihilation of the mind. So that is the conclusion. He began this paragraph by saying there is no adequate means of uh, of bringing about the, the dis by what he referred to as uh, adakum, the, the, destructive, the, the uh, cessation of the mind in the first sentence is what he refers to here in the last sentence as manonasa. Manonasa means the permanent cessation of mind. So pranayama will can, uh, can be an aid to restrain the mind temporarily or, or to bring about a temporary cessation of mind, but it cannot bring about manonasa. Why? Because the only adequate means to bring about manonasa is atmavichara. Um, there are three sentences that were later added in this paragraph. They were not in the original version. They were not in any of the answers that Bhagavan gave to uh, Shiva Kash and Pillai. They were not in the original essay version that Bhagavan wrote around 1926 or 1927. They first appeared in uh, the question and answer version around 1936. And later, they seem to have been added in the essay version. Those three sentences are, I'll just go through them quickly. That is, uh, after the sentence where he said, therefore, when the mind subsides, the prana will also subside. And when the prana subsides, the mind will also subside. Three sentences have been interpolated. The first one says, however, in sleep, even though the mind has ceased or subsided, the prana does not cease. Uh, it is arranged thus by the ordinance of God for the purpose of protecting the body and so that other people do not wonder whether the body has died. When the mind has, uh, when the mind ceases uh, in waking and in samadhi, um, uh, the prana ceases. Um, these three sentences it is possible that Bhagavan did answer this in reply to someone. I suspect how these came to be added is that someone objected. When, when Bhagavan says, that when the mind subsides, the prana subsides, and when the prana subsides, the mind subsides, someone, someone who didn't have a deep understanding of his teaching would say, oh, but Bhagavan in sleep, the prana continues. How is that? And then understand. Uh, that is, according to Bhagavan, there is no body at all in sleep. There's no body or world or anything. It's only in the view of others that the body seems to exist. And those others exist only in our waking state. That is, when we see someone else sleeping, their body seems to be breathing. Sometimes we even hear them snoring. But that's only in our view because we're in the waking state. When we are so far asleep, we're not aware of any of Thing. According to Bhagavan, when we are asleep, there is no body or world or prana or anything. That is, that is the deeper teaching of Bhagavan. But not everyone was ready to grasp this. So since someone who objected, oh no, the breathing continues, when even when the body continues, Bhagavan may first have said, in whose view does the breathing continue? Not in your view, only in the view of others who tell you that your breathing continues only after you come back to a waking state. Bhagavan may have answered like that. But since that person obviously wasn't satisfied, Bhagavan may have then have gone on to say, okay, uh, yes, uh, the breathing continues even when you're asleep. Um, it, it's arranged thus according to, by the ordinance of God for the purpose of protecting the body. In other words, this is a diluted teaching. This is not Bhagavan's real teaching. Because Bhagavan's real teaching is in sleep, there is no body or world or anything. Um, uh, so that that's the, uh, that I suspect is the context in which these three sentences were added. And then that person would have said, oh, Bhagavan, this is a very good explanation. Shouldn't we add this in, in there in that uh, paragraph of Nana? Bhagavan would say, okay, go and do what you want. If you want to add it, add it. So 
that it is not, it was not part of the original answers that Bhagavan gave. Uh, so we, we need to bracket off those three sentences and understand that they are just a diluted. Um, they, it, 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 Bhagavan giving a more diluted teaching to, to suit the, um, because if people are not willing to accept Bhagavan's deeper teachings, he well, he will come down to their level and teach them what is appropriate at their level. But the deeper teaching of Bhagavan is that the, the, the body and world exist only in the view of ego. So in the absence of ego, there is no body and world. In sleep, ego is absent. So are there any other questions that you, any of you would like to ask? Somewhat unrelated question? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, back to the subject, it's always an interesting subject for me, or self-inquiry. It is more helpful That to is me the to subject. <laughs> <laughs> it's always more, more helpful to me to think of it as self-investigation. Yes. But I have to be honest, that there's, you know, being raised Catholic means you're raised with guilt full-time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, sometimes I feel guilty that I'm not actually digging down into the terra firma to find out what it is I'm trying to investigate. It sounds, it sounds as if, I mean, I should be doing my job better, so I, I can feel shame about it. It sounds as if, don't turn your attention to what you're not, simply look at who you are. Yes, yes. That doesn't take investigation. That just takes a commitment to do that one function. Yes. Am I missing something? Is there more to self-investigation? No, no. That, that is... If if we are if we are feeling guilt, but we are not practicing this more deeply, how does that help us? <laughs> not um, at all. It, it's just again another thought that in the in the tenth paragraph, Bhagavan says, "However great a sinner one may be, instead of lamenting and weeping, I am a sinner. How am I going to be saved? If one completely rejects the thought that one is a sinner and is zealous instead." Um, or steadfast in self-attentiveness, one will certainly be saved. One of my favorite thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so let the, the, the ego that is aware of itself as Ted is guilty of far, far worse sins than just not being self-attentive. But whatever great sins you may have done in the past, and we all did great sins in the past because we've been around for... Um, one dream after another, and slowly, slowly undergoing a process of uh, of gradual um, purification of mind and uh, um, uh, becoming more and more mature and ripe for this. But in the past, we would have been we would have been the worst rogues. We would have been worse than Hitler or uh, Stalin or any of these people. We, we would have been terrible. But there's no point in regretting what we did in the past. Who am I now? When we know what we actually are, we were never a sinner. So uh, we shouldn't be, that is, whatever thought may arise, as Bhagavan says, whether it's a thought of guilt or whether it's a thought, or oh, I'm not practicing this uh, adequately, none of us are practicing it adequately. If we were practicing it adequately, we'd be lost long ago. We would have lost ourselves long ago. We would have dissolved back into our source. But rather than thinking, oh, I'm not doing this enough, we can only practice self-investigation at the present moment. Thinking, oh, I must practice more in future, you're again, you're thinking of the future. You can't practice in the future, you can only practice now. You can't practice in the past, you can't practice in the future. You can only practice. What we are investigating is I am, not what I was or what I will be, but what I am now. So we need to be so much fixed in the present. And what, but what is present? The only thing that is ever present is I am. So we need to hold on to that ever present I am. Okay, the last moment you weren't attending to yourself doesn't matter. Now you can attend to yourself. At each moment, every moment of our life is an opportunity to be self-attentive. And every moment that we are self-attentive, it's one more step closer to our goal. So 
it doesn't matter how inadequate our effort may be, at least a, even a small effort goes a long way in this path. So let us at least be making a, no matter how inadequate it may be, let us at least make some effort. And the more effort we make, the more it will be a snowballing process. It, 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 that is, the, the more we practice this, the more we we will gain that love to go deeper and deeper and deeper within. I try not to explain this to people, especially if they don't ask. I used to impose it on people, but they <laughs> ask or not. And now I try not to tell it to people very much, even yeah. if they do ask. There's the no problem. point in telling anyone who is not interested. One of the problems in explaining how to exit the path of ego by suggesting that you are the I am comes off to the untrained ear as egoful, as the most egoful. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Because of a lack of viveka, a yes. lack of ability to distinguish I am from the person that we seem to be. We are so wrapped up in this person, taking this person to be ourselves. It's so radical. There's, as I've said many times, and Julie has too. Well, I think she has. I, we talk about it at least. There's almost nobody else to talk to. Yeah. Other yeah. than the handful yeah. of her and the handful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that has its own consequences. Mm. You become sequestered. But talking about it is yeah. not the point. But talking about it is not the point. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they still live in this pretend body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This peak, I walk down the street and see pretend people. Yeah, yeah I think I do. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it, if we think about it, how 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 real is this experience? I am this body. How how solid it seems to be. But what makes this experience, I am this body, I am Michael, I am Ted, what makes this False awareness seems so real. It's the I am in it, the, the real element in it. So what is actually real is only I am. But because I take my I take myself to be I am Michael. Michael seems to me so real. So Michael's life is so important to me. So I spend all my life thinking about Michael's welfare and everything. But none of this is real. What is real is only I am. So we have to disentangle ourselves from this false identification. And we can disentangle ourselves by only, only by holding on to what is real, namely ourself. To the extent to which we hold on to ourselves, we thereby let go of everything else. Even though you're not real, you're such a treasure to us. And I <laughs> sometimes remind people, yes. as they did, Marty have in the past, but it's been a while. We have some new people that you in part become sustained in this yeah. you know, illusory world. By Michael and Ted both uh, share the same degree of reality or unreality. But what gives a seeming reality to both Michael and Ted is the I am in the false awareness, I am Michael or Ted. I get that. <laughs> You interrupted me because I was going to say, that, and I'm, I'm kidding when I say this. Uh, your illusory life form is sustained in part by donations by your followers. And <laughs> we've got some new people here that I don't believe are even aware of it. And if they have any interest, they can email you know, Dan or Marty or me, and I can tell them how easy it is to make that. Well, <laughs> that. It's all in Bhagavan's hands, so don't worry about that. If Bhagavan wants to provide the, the material needs of this body, he will provide for them. So we, we don't even have to leave it. Leave all that to Bhagavan. <laughs> Bhagavan is taking care of everything. If he's taking care of our spiritual welfare, that's the, that's the most important thing. But if he's taking care of our spiritual welfare, will he not also take care of our trivial material welfare as long as this body is needed when the body has served its purpose it will drop off <laughs> sooner or later mm -hmm. 
But what is the purpose of having this body? The purpose of having this body is to leave the body and cling to I am. Can't you say there isn't really any purpose anyhow because the body doesn't really exist? Yes. Purpose. Or is that just like a play on words? Yes. Yes. It's, it's we who give the purpose. That is, any purpose of our life is the purpose we give it. For some people, the purpose of life is um, earning lots of money, being very rich, or other people it may be political power, or other people it may be learning a lot. So the life has no purpose at all. It's only the purpose that we give it. But uh, if we want to be free of this life, the purpose of this life is to investigate ourselves and know what we actually are. And know, but then only we can say this life is unreal, this body is unreal. Until then, this body seems so real. Why does this body seem to be real? Because what is real is only I am. And so long as I take this body to be I, the body seems to be real. And because this body is part of the world, the whole world seems to be real. But what is actually real, where do all these things get their seeming reality from? Only from I am. So if, if uh, the only real purpose of life is to know and to be I am. But we are always knowing and being I am. We're not there anything other than that. But we seem to have been separated from that by rising as ego. So by holding on to I am, we dissolve this, um, this uh, illusion of, of separation and multiplicity. We've got a few minutes left here. Michael, do you, would you like to continue on with paragraph 10 or uh, just hold off until next time? Um, paragraph 10 is in the, I mean, not the paragraph, we've done paragraph 8. The next one is paragraph 9. Oh, excuse um, me. It, it is a continuation of this, but um, there's, I think, I think we may as well keep it for next time. I'll probably go through it quite quickly because it's not, I mean, it, whatever Bhagavan said is important, but it's not, a, it's not the central teaching of Bhagavan. It will become really interesting. I mean, if I, next time, I think if I go through nine quite quickly, we can then go on to the two most, arguably the two most important paragraphs, which are 10 and 11. Because they are the ones where Bhagavan is talking about what is the problem we're all up against. That's our Vishaya of asanas. And how to overcome them. That is so the 10 and 11 are two very, very crucial paragraphs. Well, we have several people who haven't said anything today. And I'm sure, well, I'm not sure of anything really, but maybe they have <laughs> questions and they were just reluctant to ask. So why don't we open it up to the people who haven't? Uh, there's sure only one yeah. thing we can be sure of. That is, I am. <laughs> Everything else could be an illusion and is an illusion. What oh. is real is only I am. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me think about that. It's the only thing that is indubitably, indubitably real. Like we can doubt everything else. But the one thing we cannot doubt is our own existence and our own awareness. <laughs> We cannot reasonably doubt them. Thank you so much, Michael. We're very grateful. All Sorry. thanks to Bhagavan. All thanks Thank to you, Bhagavan. Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. If, I had, if I was bringing anything of my own, I would accept your thanks. But I've got nothing of my own. I'm only just saying what <laughs> Bhagavan has taught us. So I've got nothing to offer <laughs> except what Bhagavan has taught us. Well, we're going to thank you anyway, Michael. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm well, afraid so. <laughs> yeah, you can be the transparent <laughs> portal to, to Ramana. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you. I only mentioned that because we had somebody here named iPhone, and I don't know who that is. Mysterious. Drop the phone and keep the phone. He's really an iPhone. He's only the eye. <laughs> Drop the phone. Yes, right. I like that. Well, 
we're all in the tiger's jaw, right, Michael? Exactly, exactly. But Bhagavan says, we're coming to that later, in the 12th paragraph, we are all in the tiger's jaw. However, we have to follow unfailingly in accordance with the past we have shown. In the same right. paragraph, Bhagavan concludes that paragraph say, saying, so we're in the tiger's jaw, but we're still struggling. And so long as we're still struggling, <laughs> The, the tiger isn't going to eat us until we yield ourselves. And we yield ourselves don't, don't, by holding on to I. Right. By being self -aware. Don't Don't fight the tiger. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. So the tiger's got a firm hold on us, but it'll continue holding us, not swallowing us, until we give ourselves wholeheartedly. Well, I appreciate the tiger's jaw for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. We feel nice and Thanks, secure everybody. in the tiger's jaw, even though we are still, still not yielding well, we, ourselves completely. But there are moments we need we need that reassurance. Yes, yes, yes. True, true, very true. <laughs>